Um, welcome everyone. For those of you that have joined us live today, this is the virtual open day 2023 for the MSc programs at the Energy Institute. Uh, before we start, um, I'm just I just need to ask you to mute our, uh, yourselves while we are presenting. And feel free at any point to pop in a question at the chat and we'll try to answer it um, today. Or if there's not enough time, we'll definitely get back to you. Right, so three programs today are going to be presented. We will start with Smart Energy and the Built Environment MSc program. Then we will talk about the Energy Systems and Data Analytics MSc, and we'll finish with Economics and Policy of Energy and the Environment MSc program. Now, starting with the MSc in Smart Energy and the Built Environment, or CB, as we call it, um, hello, everyone. I am Dr. Desfina Manuseli. I am the director of the program, so I'll be telling you all about that today. But let me start with um, a discussion around why this is an important topic to study. So you all know that the world's climate is in crisis, temperatures are rising, uh, the same applies for sea levels, the, the number of extreme events, um, like heat waves or storms is increasing as well. We've got forest fires that have swept across large areas. And of course, these issues are expected to have a very big impact on our economy, on our lives, on the planet. Now, energy is essential to the way of life, uh, to heat our homes, our offices, to cook food, we use energy for entertainment, it provides us with transport and more. Now, talking about energy use in the built environment, which is the buildings that we live, we work, and the ones that we use in our leisure time, that is the biggest energy demand sector in the world, associated with 40% of global energy demand. Uh, the carbonization of energy used in our built environment is therefore a central part of fighting climate change, and smart energy is expected to play a major role. Now, what is smart energy and why are we talking about smart and smartness? Right, uh, electricity generation is, is moving away from simply burning fossil fuels and towards zero carbon methods like renewables, nuclear, and capturing carbon emissions from fossil fuel uh, power plants. Um, however, these methods of generating electricity are quite inflexible, especially compared to burning fossil fuels, which is very, very flexible because we can do it whenever we want whenever we need this extra energy. Now, nuclear renewables lack the convenience of those traditional fossil fuels. At the same time, our heating and our transport are expected to transition away from directly burning fossil fuels with a wide scale electrification of these two sectors in many, in many countries. So that means that electricity demand is effectively increasing quite a lot. Now, we expect a quite big revolution in the way that our energy system works by shifting the flexibility to consumption, right? So we used to have flexibility in our generation. Now we're shifting that to consumption. And we can achieve that using smart technology. So essentially using storage and managing the demand to meet our generation. Um, at the moment, there's a big international investment into these technologies that can enable us um, to decarbonize and uh, also to make our energy system more connected, more reliable. And this is exactly the focus of this MSC program, Smart Energy in the Built Environment. Uh, it's a really exciting new field, and we are really delighted to offer the program to you, and uh, we are aiming to train you to be at the forefront of this change, of this big revolution, if you will, in energy and the built environment. 
Right, so this is the structure of uh, the modules that we offer throughout term one, term two, and term three. Uh, in term one, you have four core modules. Uh, that means these are uh, mandatory for you to take. You've got fundamentals of smart energy in the built environment, uh, energy systems in society, introduction to smart energy data and statistics, and modeling community energy systems. While in term two, you only have one core module. Uh, this is the smart distributed energy systems. And then you need to choose three optional modules from a wide range of options. Now, there are uh, optional modules, the ones that you see here in this list, that have been developed by us, uh, especially for this MSc program. Now, these will always be available to you. And these are the urban building energy modeling, data analytics in the smart built environment, social value and new energy business models, and smart energy solutions in the built environment. So apart from these, you can also choose optional modules from a list of optional modules from other MSc programs. However, we cannot guarantee a place in these, uh, in these modules. A little bit about assessment. Uh, most assessment is uh, via coursework for most modules. We've got two modules that are assessed uh, by examination. Um, yeah, through coursework, you you're expected to develop the skills that you will need for work or for further study. For example, some of you might pursue uh, a PhD after your MSc. So we'll be targeting many different skills throughout the MSc program. Um, now in term three, it's time that you um, focus on your dissertation. So a little bit more about that. What is a dissertation? Um, it's your opportunity to undertake original research um, on a topic that excites you, something that you're interested in, essentially. Now, apart from that, there will be opportunities for you to be placed with uh, one of our internationally recognized research groups and collaborate on your project with leading researchers. Uh, we've got the Building Stock Lab, we've got the Physical Characterization of Buildings Group, the PACE Group, which uh, stands for uh, People, Adaptability, Comfort and Smart Energy. Then you've got the Smart Energy Research Group and finally the Islands Research Laboratory. Uh, every year there are also opportunities to, to work with organizations outside UCL for your dissertation. Right, so smart energy is a very fast moving field, right? So there are um, opportunities, challenges, business offerings, um, policy that's ever changing, and all of these needs to be related to the latest research findings. So having a clear connection to research is essential in this subject. Um, now, in this MSc program, this link, this connection is, isn't just in the knowledge that you will gain, but it's also in the skills that you will develop throughout this year that you're going to be studying with us. Um, so how? How are we going to achieve that? Um, so our lectures and tutorials have up-to-date uh, content that is informed by latest research we enable uh, development of your research skills throughout the MSc. Um, for most of your modules, there will be discussions, there will be debates in class. You'll have, uh, you'll have to look at different examples and case studies. Of course, you will need to have uh, some hands-on time with, uh, with real research. And as I said, you'll have the opportunity to join leading researchers in their research groups uh, during your dissertation. Um, so a few more words about the interdisciplinarity of the course. So CB is quite interdisciplinary, but um, it's so easy uh, to see energy use in the built environment like a technical problem, which it is. It is a technical problem uh, governed by, by physical laws, but also you can see it as a social issue, right, around individuals, around organizations. 
Um, but the truth is that to fully understand uh, smart energy in the built environment, you need to consider the technical, the organizational, the business, and all the different individual issues around it. Um, so we don't intend to make physical scientists into social scientists, and we don't intend to make social scientists into physical scientists or data analysts, right? That would take a lot longer than one single year MSA. But we do have a very strong emphasis on, on understanding the different dimensions of the challenges that we face in this field. And we want to ensure that when you complete the course, you will respect contributions of different di disciplines in, in the smart uh, built environment. Now, a few more words about our industry seminars, which are quite unique to this MSc program. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to hear from key players in the industry. So what do we do? We, we invite every year five or six speakers from the industry and we have in, informal discussions with them on campus. This is where you also meet with uh, the rest of the students, you socialize, uh, you also meet sometimes with uh, students from other MSc programs because we do invite them sometimes if there are spaces available. Um, so this is a good opportunity for you to understand a little bit better the work of uh, different professionals like consultants and others in the field. As an example, we've had talks by CBC, uh, OVO Energy, E.ON, Evora Global and quite a few others. Who should apply to our MSc? Um, as I said, this is an interdisciplinary field, an interdisciplinary MSc. We are looking for applicants from a wide range of backgrounds, but we do need an upper second class honors degree at minimum. Uh, or a first class degree in, for example, um, physics, related physics science, physical sciences, in engineering, mathematics, or geography, psychology, social science, architecture, planning, and economics. And these are just some examples. But the main thing we want to see in your applications, apart from your qualifications, is a genuine interest and enthusiasm to learn with us. So please do make sure that this is reflected in your personal statements. Now, finally, if you need more information about our MSc, uh, just uh, search on Google CBUCL MSc and look at the top two results that you get. There are videos from our module leaders as well online, so make sure you watch these as well so that you get uh, a good understanding of what the different modules um, represent and what will these be teaching you. If you want to get in touch, this is my email address and uh, you can see Dr. Pamela Fennell's email address just below. Pamela is the deputy director of, uh, of the course. And finally, we do recommend applying early to secure a place. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting you. I'm going to, to, to stop here and um, Dr. Amir Garave, uh, who is the director of uh, SMSC is going to be talking to you next. Thank you. Amir, you're on mute. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. My name is uh, Dr. Amir Garabi, and I'm course director for uh, Energy System and Data Analytics, uh, ESDA. Yeah. Uh, just a little bit about uh, our course. So uh, our program started in uh, 2018 and was one of the, the, the earliest, uh, I mean, in uh, energy the data analysis. Uh, also, the, our course is the interdisciplinary course. So it's a combination of machine learning, AI, and energy. And um, our uh, mission was to, to tackle the digital skill gap uh, which is uh, existing in the energy uh, sector and also to adaptation of AI towards uh, decarbonization and uh, greener energy. 
Uh, so, uh, our objective for ESDA is to accurately you read all comprehensive material and up to the data and latest material, and you will get a very good understanding of how energy system it works, and you can combine it with artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So, and also we are aiming to prepare you for as an energy data scientist of the uh, future. And uh, so uh, I would like to mention that uh, ESDA is not only just a program, it's just a platform to prepare you, to provide you all of the skills and tools you need to be a, a proper uh, energy data scientist toward the energy transition and be successful in, in this journey. Uh, so uh, let's just start with what is energy transition and what is important. So energy transition is uh, moving from uh, fossil related material toward cleaner energy, toward renewable energy. And why is it important? Because it's the third energy transition we are having. So it is not the first one, but it is very important because we are facing lots of challenges, lots of uh, uncertainties and opportunity. And it is very important for uh, all of us to get involved and be a part of uh, this transition at the start. So uh, uh, the question is how we can be successful in uh, this journey, how we can have a robust and sustainable and durable uh, I mean, energy transition. So we can do it by addressing uh, I mean, energy terrorism. As you could see, we have three elements here, energy security, uh, environmental sustainability, and uh, energy equity. So uh, what is happening uh, at the moment? And so because of we, at the in, uh, past five years, we had three important factors. So we had war uh, in Europe, we have Corona, and also now inflation. So now what's happening, this balance is not the, the, the same. And more country uh, and governments, they pay attention to energy security and uh, by uh, paying more weight uh, towards energy security and uh, we uh, know the, basically they have more attention toward uh, energy i mean environmental sustainability uh, as well so how we can be uh, successful on that so this is why we need to add more elements to it Yes. Yeah. So now by uh, adding more elements, for example, we can go the, towards from energy to, uh, trial lama to cardinal lama, which I will show you in the, the following next slide. Thank you. So as you could see now, yes, we have the fourth element added to this uh, trial lama. Well, now we have a cardinal lama. So this is the community benefit. This is a uh, our responsibility. This is my responsibility. This is your responsibility. And this is the responsibility of whoever is in uh, energy sector. So we have duty to work together, to collaborate together, to have a very successful uh, energy transition. So now uh, the question is how, as an uh, energy, uh, I mean, uh, uh, data scientist or uh, as an uh, energy student for ESDA, you can contribute and you can have an important, significant impact on the energy transition. So now by joining uh, our course, so you can have, uh, I mean, very good, uh, I mean, collaboration with research and innovation, contribute to research and innovation. Also, you can uh, apply all of your knowledge you're learning during this course toward data analysis and uh, modeling. Also, you can engage in policy making or raise awareness. We can organize an educational workshop. And most importantly, you can collaborate with uh, stakeholders, with in industries and researchers and uh, so on. So uh, this is a, uh, some example of uh, our uh, previous, uh, I mean, successful uh, stories of our students. For example, the Devon Hackton uh, Prize uh, two, two years ago, and also our students are constantly uh, pr contributing uh, towards the uh, journals, but by uh, conducting the, their project and their research. And in uh, terms of industry partnership, I would like to say we have a very good connection with industry. Uh, I mean, uh, companies, for example, we have a very good relationship with, with uh, Octopus, uh, Google, DeepMind, uh, ADF, uh, Shell, and uh, other uh, energy companies. 
so in the terms of your job after graduation, most of our graduation students, they all get, uh, get job in energy sector. However, they get a very good chance to get in banking and finance, uh, also in upper stream and downstream oil and gas, for example, Shell, uh, Octopus, uh, National Grid. And also you have a very good chance to, uh, if you, to uh, I mean, uh, go on further your study or academic uh, studies towards your PhD, for, for example. And uh, I would like to mention that AI jobs now are booming. If you look at uh, indeed, or uh, you, you look at, uh, I mean, uh, LinkedIn and Indeed, you will see that AI jobs are more than 300 percent advertisement for the last two, three months. So uh, these are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, our course structure, as you could see, I highlighted in green one. The green one is core module. So you have four core module in term one. Uh, energy system, energy data analysis, static for energy analysis, and especially uh, analysis of uh, energy data. So you need to do it in the uh, term one. Term two, you have two core modules, uh, energy uh, and uh, transport uh, analytic, and uh, as well as uh, advanced machine learning, uh, and for, for energy system. So, and in term three, you will need to do dissertation as well. Uh, also, we have, uh, I mean, the choice of, uh, I mean, the optional module, you need to choose one optional module from this list. And the one I highlighted in red, this is for very good, good course from uh, econometrics, uh, which we uh, offer um, uh, for ESO for all the students from ESO. Uh, so uh, you can apply it uh, through our, I mean, uh, the website, the, the link is over there, and you can also uh, con uh, direct, uh, directly contact me, a.garavi at ucl.ac.uk, or you can uh, contact Aiden as well. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, we're looking forward to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Thank you. Right. Um, right. So we're now going to talk about um, the third uh, MSc program that we're presenting today. Um, and I'm Catherine Willer, and I'm the program director of the MSc, and it's called the Economics and Policy of Energy and the Environment. Um, and Despina's kindly going to turn the slides for me. So you're just going to have to wait whilst I say next slide, please, or not. So Despina, I need you to go back because I'm going to talk about the title for the moment. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, so. The reason I'm talking about the title is because we have a really long name um, for our MSc. So we call it the EPEE to make it shorter and more manageable. Um, but it's actually quite useful to have a long name sometimes because it pretty much tells you uh, what this MSc does. Um, so quite clearly, we have um, an economics focus to this MSc. We look at economic solutions um, to the sort of climate problems that Despina was talking about right at the beginning of this presentation. There are quite some serious environmental um, and energy related issues out there for us to face globally. Um, so we might be looking at optimization modeling, we might be looking at the levelized cost of electricity, we might be looking at how to put a price on carbon. Those are all potential economic solutions to our problems. But those problems, have to be implemented in the real world and therefore it's important also to look at policy yeah no no one is going to implement a carbon pricing system unless the government wants to do it businesses want to follow it people understand what it's there for um and therefore that dialogue between the economics and the policy elements between the quantitative and the qualitative is really important um and that's the kind of dialogue that we're trying to explore through the MSc. So it, it has that economics lens, but it is also multidisciplinary. Um, in the title as well, um, we do talk about the environment, but I would say on this course, we do tend to emphasize energy and climate change more. Um, and that's probably something um, to be aware of. OK, you can turn over, Despina. Thank you. <laughs> Right, so on this course, we take around 80 students a year, give or take, um, but largely every year. Um, so the students come from all over the world um, and that's great um, because climate change is a global problem and no one country is going to solve that on its own. So it's brilliant that you, you get to meet each other um, and see things from very different perspectives. Um, so last year we have 44 countries and five continents represented within our 80 students, which is amazing. 
Um, people come in from a variety of previous academic study, and I will talk about the things we're looking for at the end of the presentation. Um, and people also come in with a variety of work experience as well. Just like the other MSCs that you've been hearing about already, our students do go on to careers in a really wide variety of things as well. So not only do you come in with diversity, you also leave, leave and go to diverse places. Um, and again, being a global MSC, those careers are around the world. So we have students in national government, in international and national institutions, but you might also be looking at the third sector, NGOs, at think tanks. Uh, we have students who go on and work in major consultancies or perhaps some of the more boutique um, energy consultancies as well. And we also get students who go on to PhDs as well. Several students here, someone emailed me this morning um, and said she was gonna go on and do a PhD. So it, it, we, we definitely get that as well. Um, Shall we, yeah, let's, shall we move on to the next slide? Yeah, okay, so for structure, unsurprisingly, we also have three terms. Um, so first term, four core modules. Second term, three optional modules. And term three, the dissertation. And also in term one and term two, you're gonna take a research concepts and methods course um, to help you develop the skills that you need to do really well um, in all those other modules. Okay, so in term one, um, as I said, you've got these core modules that everyone takes. So all of the students uh, take these modules together. Um, and the point of that is that you all get the same foundational knowledge, the same um, core foundation to the knowledge that you're gonna need um, wherever you go on to um, and whatever optional modules you take in term two. Um, and a lot of our alumni students who've taken this before say that that sort of multidisciplinary overview is really, really useful. Um, it's also nice because, you know, you've all arrived in London and it's nice to spend term one all in the same modules getting to know each other. So we take you through uh, environmental and resource economics, which is our core quantitative economics module. Um, we also uh, introduce you to energy modeling and scenarios. Um, and I think that's one of the things that UCL in Energy Institute does really well, actually. We've got a fantastic modeling team. You won't see this um, on many other um, interdisciplinary courses. Um, so I think that's the real strength of you know, everything in the Energy Institute, actually. Um, we look at environmental measurement assessment and law. So clearly we need laws, we need policies to help protect the environment. You know, what have we got? Does it work? How do you measure things like natural capital? And we have a big um, political economy module around energy and climate change. Uh, just as Amir was saying, you know, could not be more current. Some of these geopolitical issues around energy, absolutely vital to understand that, as well as the research concepts and methods module. Okay, term two, um, you choose three optional modules from a sort of a wide set. That's a fairly typical set of things that we might offer on the right hand side, although it, it varies from year to year. Um, unlike some universities, we don't require you to take a particular route. Um, you are free to choose um, and make those optional modules your own. So you can specialize if you like. So you can specialize in the more quantitative economics, if you like, e econometrics, economic methods for decision-making, behavioral economics. You could look at policy through innovation, electricity market design, um, some of the behavioral aspects, um, perhaps policy in developing countries. You could look at things through industry, through business and sustainability or the financial industry. Or you can mix and match between all of those things. It, it is up to you. Um, but you will also all together take the research concepts and methods module, which prepares you for the dissertation, which is our term three activity. On the next slide, perfect, thank you. Um, so the dissertation um, is your chance um, to dive in deep to something that really interests you. So you can see as you go through from term one, core knowledge, term two, start to specialize by the time you reach term three, 
um, you've really started to develop um, that level of detail um, and that level of interest. Um, and as a result, students do a really wide range of different things, actually. So you can see there just some things I pulled out that were done last year. For instance, someone was looking at alternative fuels for aircraft, blockchain in lithium mining, um, policy transfer in terms of photovoltaic recycling, the impact of nat nat natural gas prices um, in the post-COVID world, um, and gender equality and social inclusion in Kenya. So you can see there's a huge variety of subjects, but also a huge variety of methods there between the students as well. So I'm just gonna finally talk about, if you're interested in this program, how would you apply? Um, so similarly to the other MSCs, we are looking for a minimum upper second class UK bachelors or an overseas equivalent in economics or a STEM subject, so science, technology, engineering, or maths. We do, however, because I mentioned that the course is multidisciplinary, make exceptions for that, as long as you can demonstrate some sort of aptitude for quantitative analysis, which you will need for the course. Um, so perhaps something you've taken outside your undergraduate or you've got work experience that has helped you develop those skills. Um, but what's really, really important is you explain how that background relates to the programme in your personal statement and really what you want to achieve through it. Our applications are open until the end of May. Um, we do get a really large number of applications. So I would recommend applying early just to get that decision um, as quickly as you can. And there's a link there to our graduate prospectus. OK, um, that was everything that, that we wanted to say. Um, if anyone's got questions, um, you can place those in the chat um, and we will do our very best to, to answer them. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Catherine. So we have a few questions. So it's, um, the first question says, um, for those programs, is there any way that the master student dissertations are made available to public once completed? So maybe we'll go for Catherine first. Uh, actually, no, we don't, um, Matthew. So n we do publish some of our dissertations sometimes, um, which is uh, one of the things that we're quite proud of in the MSc is that some of our students go on to publish their dissertations as research publications. But that's but we wouldn't necessarily publish the the dissertation itself um, through um, our website unless we wanted to highlight it as a case study. But I mean, I'm more than welcome to talk about the sort of things that students do, if that's the origin of the question. Do you despair, and Amina? No, no the same. Yeah, no, the same. Not no, not do, not do you want to unshare the slides, Despina, so we can... Yeah. Great. So we have another question for Amir. Okay. So for the ESTA MSc, which, um, what is the average age of your students? Do you usually have students with work experience or is it more focused on students coming directly from undergraduate? Yeah. So basically, too, I could say the average is a majority of our students is something, uh, no mature student because they already uh, did on their first degree. So I could say the majority of our course uh, would be 25 to 30, 32. And um, uh, so we consider uh, work experience, but uh, most of the students, when we mentioned, because they're young and they are just finished their the degree, they don't have those sort of work experience. But uh, however, we have some student data work experience as well. So definitely we consider that. Thank you, Amir. Yeah. So Catherine, we have one for Epi. So what is the waiting for the course grading? I think they're basically saying, how how is the course graded? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna, right, I will explain how the assessments work. If that's not what you're asking, type away um, and tell me if, if I've got that wrong. Okay, so we have a, quite deliberately a range of assessments actually. So the core modules, two of them are written examinations in person. One of them is a presentation uh, assessment. Um, and two of them are essay based. So already whatever you, you know, optionals you do, that's the sort of core forms of assessment. 
um, depending on the optionals that you take, you might have more written exams, you might have more presentations, group work, essays. Um, it it depend. You can therefore. Um, it depends on what you select. You can find your own way through um, that assessment, but the core modules, um, that, that's how they're assessed and that's what everyone would get assessed on from term one. Um, if that doesn't answer your question, um, do let me know. Thank you, Catherine. So for Amir, for ESDA, is there any site visit to a company that aims to make students get exposure? Uh, so, the basic, yeah, okay. so the basically, we uh, don't have a, that, that sort of a facility now. But however, uh, during a, a each year, we attending the two or three conferences and exhibitions, for example, in Olympia in London. So most of those, those companies are uh, coming over there, and energy companies or uh, AI companies. So uh, students are in a close contact with, with them uh, and so that they can get uh, information or even they can get, for example, some project or internship uh, from them. Thank you, Amir. And you. maybe um, also mention that we have um, companies coming to lectures yes, as yeah, well as a guest, and guest yeah, lecturers. The, the guest lecturers, we, we have for all of our module guest lecturers that are coming and mostly they are coming from uh, the different industry. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'll say um, for, I'll go to CB first. How long would it take to receive a response after an application has been submitted? Now that, that varies greatly and it depends on the time of the year. So I would say that at the moment and just after Christmas is a good time to apply because you typically would get a quicker response, at least for CB. And as you go towards Easter and after Easter, when we receive the bulk of, of the applications, then things start to get um, a little bit more um, hectic. But I see it's a question for EP. EP. Oh, uh, maybe Catherine could mention as well, and Amir, how long does it take to get an offer? Yeah. So for us, we more or less the, the same, but uh, I suppose from uh, compared to last year, I, I could say around uh, four to eight weeks, we can receive that offer. Catherine? Yeah, I'd say that's fair. I, I think both Despina and Amir's comments are correct. It, it depends on the time of year. It depends on, on the volume. Mm -hmm. It also depends on, you know, how quickly things like your references, which is the next question, how quickly those come <laughs> through as well, um, because there are things that that, that we can't control um, in the process as well. Um, there Thank is you. a question there, isn't there, Delhi, around recommendation letters? Yes. So if someone has been working in another country for more than five years, is it okay to provide the two reference letters from workplace instead of getting from academic advisor in my um, their own country? Um, so because this is a question about EPE specifically, I'll answer it from my perspective. Um, I would recommend having an academic reference. Um, I wouldn't mind having one from the workplace, absolutely, because you're probably doing something relevant and interesting in which you've built up your skills, great. Um, but ultimately, it's an academic programme, um, an academic qualification. So I would definitely get a reference um, from your qualification, even if it's some time ago. We really, really don't mind. Thank you, Catherine. What about you, Despina? So we typically require at least one uh, academic reference at the very least. Yeah, and yeah, everything else um, applies as Catherine discussed. Thank you. Amir? Uh, so for us, uh, similar to Catherine and uh, the spinner that they mentioned, so uh, at least one academic and one in the industry, uh, I mean, the recommendation letter would be fine. Thank you. So I think I'll go to Catherine first for this. Um, how much does UCL consider an applicant's related background, including undergraduate and work experience, compared to applicants' passion to switch into the energy field from their previous background? What a great question. Um, I, I really like, that's why I was emphasizing the personal statement. I love to see a passion to switch into the energy field. Um, I think that that's absolutely what we're all about, right? We're, we're trying to, you know, we need 
educated professionals with sensible and intelligent solutions to to energy and climate change and absolutely come and learn that brilliant um however um you know if you can make that shine through your application wonderful but we do need to see um that you have the academic background that will allow you uh, to do well at the course yeah and that will suit you yeah so we're looking to see also whether you fit with those academic requirements so you don't need to have done environmental economics before but your academic background does, does need to show an aptitude or the skills that would allow you um, to do well at something like environmental economics or policy analysis thank you everyone um Catherine, can i just ask a question how um how is the epi program structured for part-time students the part-time students so i'll talk about part-time as well as modular flexible actually because there are two different ways of doing it if you don't want to do it full-time so if you are a part-time student you basically take half the modules each year yeah with the, and in the second year you need to take the dissertation if you are, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's possible to therefore split the MSc over the two years and you would need to complete it within the two years. If you need more flexibility, there is also something called modular flexible study, which gives you five years um, to complete the qualification, um, in which case you take the modules as they fit around your schedule. So this can work really well for students who've got, um, you know, significant work commitments. Um, and you'd be, you would need to take them um, in a logical order um, so that you do the sort of the, the basic ones followed by the more advanced ones and the dissertation to finish up. Thank you. What about for CB? You're muted. This one. Yeah, hi. So you can take, you can choose part time, you can choose. Uh, module flexible. Um, if you're part time, you need to take four modules in year one, and then four modules and a dissertation in in year two. Um, so in uh, in term one of the first year of your MSc, uh, you will take the fundamentals core module, and you also take the energy uh, systems and society module. Um, then in term two, you take the smart distributed energy systems module, and then you choose your first optional uh, module as well. So it's, it's it, there's a very specific structure if you are a part-time student. Um, but if you're flexible, uh, you just need to take all five compulsory uh, modules and three optional modules anyway, and the dissertation over the course of a maximum of five uh, consecutive academic years. Uh, and this allows you to take the modules whenever you want, essentially, and have more time to decide. Amir, is it similar? Yes, uh, very similar to the Despina. And so basically for uh, year one, uh, as a, I mean, full time, you have to do all of these eight, 15 credits uh, in one year, but in part time is the same thing, but you do it in uh, the uh, two years uh, and uh, similar to Felix module, you can do it uh, between three to five years. However, your dissertation is going to be the, your uh, final year. Perfect. So, Amir, we have a question for oh. Esther. Can mm -hmm. the dissertation be performed with a company or does it have to be a research institute? So uh, for the dissertation, yes, yeah, it can be performed with the company in the industrial project. Uh, however, uh, your Supervisor for the that should, should be academic from our institution. Perfect. Okay. Um, can I? Okay, there's another question. Um, and all um, are unconditional offers given to students that have not yet met the minimum academic requirements, but are predicted to achieve them by the end of the undergraduate program. Despina, I can see you answering that. Yeah, so if you haven't uh, finished your undergraduate degree and we like what we see in your application, we typically send over what we call a conditional offer. And then after, um, you know, as, as time is closing up, 
till decision time if you have obtained your degree by then and you have the desired uh, two one or first class degree that we want in um, in a subject that um, we we require then that will change from a um, uh, a um, how is it called a conditional offer to mm -hmm. a to an unconditional offer essentially as long as you fulfill those requirements so you need to apply early anyway thank you um so for each person let me just ask Catherine first um do you provide interviews for applicants no we we don't provide interviews for applicants this Bina? interviews no we don't do interviews amir no no interviews thank you and can i just ask what um for epi what kind of software do you use on the program? And um, do students need to have previous skills? Uh, no, you wouldn't necessarily need to come in with any previous um, skills in terms of soft, specialist software. Um, in terms of the software that we use, um, in term one, um, the it's fairly standard Excel, PowerPoint, Word. Um, you can do all the we do modeling exercises, which are through Excel, for example, or through online tools. So there's nothing specialist needed in the first term. If you do need things in the second term, um, we do the modeling module um, uses Osmosis and Leap. Um, so, but you get we have um, the, the the teaching staff will take you through how to get the licenses for those um, and how to use them. Um, students then go on in their dissertations um, sometimes to use software. I mean, some of them do sort of regression analysis, some of them use Python, some of them use R. We do a bit of that through research concepts. We also do it through the econometrics module as well. Um, and if you're doing qualitative analysis, you might use Envivo, for example, as well. None of this um, needs sort of complex um, knowledge before you come into the programme. You wouldn't be at a disadvantage if you didn't have that. Despina, software? No, so we don't require any um, pre-existing knowledge, if you will, either in a quantitative sus um, subject or a qualitative subject. So we, we do want you to have a fundamental understanding of of both fields if that makes sense but we don't require you to know how to use programming or any qualitative pieces of software we do teach you that kind of stuff we do teach you how to use r we do teach you how to do excel in a quite advanced uh way we do teach you some different um modeling software uh, energy modeling software as well so there there will be quite a lot of things to learn we don't require any any pre-existing knowledge on on software apart from obviously the basics of excel word and, and powerpoint thank you amir uh, so uh, for us is the uh... The same, you don't need any pre-existing knowledge. Uh, for example, you will learn uh, R and uh, Python and also other um, modeling uh, I mean, uh, software. So you don't need to do that. So you will turn in both in the term one and term two uh, for any of the, those software. Perfect, thank you. So we have another question, um, pain points in CB and EPI. So Katrin, maybe if I ask this first from you. So the person has a bachelor degree in civil engineering and works as an internal auditor for a state-owned electricity company, which allows them to evaluate business processes through policy and regulation. Given the background, will you suggest um, the program, can you suggest a program that they're more likely to have a better chance in securing an offer? Is it the smart energy built environment or economics and policy of energy and environment. Katrin? Um, I wouldn't want to judge anyone's application um, in, in a short um, paragraph like that. It's just not fair on you or, or on the other applicants because we, 
we think about the applications really carefully um, and we do genuinely look at the transcripts, the personal statements, the references, the CV, um, and we we consider them in a lot of detail. So I wouldn't want to judge anyone's chances um, right now. Um, what I would say though, um, is, you know, obviously the program's competitive, they are competitive, um, and we're looking for good applicants, but you can apply to two programs um, at UCL. So if you're not sure which one you fit into, there's, you know, you can apply to both. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Despina? Yeah, so that's um, that's a tricky question because the, the I think you should ask yourself that question, really. Right, so what are your own interests? Which one of the programs is more interesting to you and why these are two very different programs right they um on cb we don't focus on economics at all and we don't focus on on policy as much as they do on the uh, msc ap so um it's it's two different programs we focus quite a lot on smart energy we teach energy modeling, we teach data analytics, but also social science related stuff. Um, so it's really a question that uh, you should make a decision about, but in case you you, you want to, to apply to both, then obviously you can apply uh, to both programs. Thank you, Despina. Um, so let me go to Catherine back. Um, what kind of academic background do most students come from? Uh, right. Okay. So we have, I would say, I, I don't know, maybe half of our students have studied economics in some form or another um, before coming onto the program, because it is an economics program, as Justina did point out. Um, but we also have people who, we've got quite a lot of people who studied engineering. Um, we also get people who've done more sort of political science, um, political economy, um, and sometimes we get sort of social scientists, finance is another um, big one that, that we get um, as well, or, or business degrees as well. So, as I said, as long as you can demonstrate your interest um, and your ability to do quantitative as well as qualitative analysis, then um, we, we would look at those. So it is deliberately quite a mixed background. Thank you, Catherine. Amir, what are the background of this? Uh, so uh, for us, it's more it's the same quantity of background. Uh, student that com coming from, uh, especially in our courses, engineering background, uh, as well as some energy they have or economics, but mostly it would be based on quantity background. Despina? Right, so CEB is more interdisciplinary. So we do, uh, as I said in my presentation, we do receive applications from uh, many different backgrounds, from social scientists to psychologists to architects to building physicists to, to engineers and mathematicians. So it's uh, a smart energy is a very uh, interdisciplinary field, uh, which you cannot really understand if you don't merge all this kind of knowledge, both from social scientists and engineers and social and building physicists. So we want a mix of backgrounds in in the in the MSc. Um, uh, yeah, but apart from your background, what I wanted to point out again is that we do also pay attention to your personal statement and how much, how big of an interest you're showing to the MSc and have you really understood what the MSc is all about? So we do place a lot of emphasis on that. So sometimes we see highly qualified um, applicants being rejected because their personal statement is just way too generic. Right, so do pay attention to that and spend some time to really think about your personal statement. Thank you, some really good advice there. Um, so we have a question for Amir. How many students do you accept each year on yeah. the S MSc ESDA program? Yeah, for uh, MSc ESDA, I would say uh, around 42 students per year. 
Um, Catherine? Uh, yep, around about 80. That's been a... Between 30 and 35. Sounds lovely. I have a question. Where are your students now for Catherine? Where did they go? <laughs> right. Um, the the range is huge, right? So EPE, this is a really hard question to answer. We've been, we've been running EPE uh, for 11 years now. They get everywhere. <laughs> so um, we have um, students who are working in the UN. Uh, we've got, um, right, I was looking at, you know, some of the, the profiles this morning um, and just five of the alumni who are featured on our website, for example, one of them is working in the UK um, in a specialist energy analysis consultancy. Someone else is working for a major big name consultancy in Asia. We've got another student's profiles up there is working um, in Latin America um, in an energy company. Um, and we have someone else working in the EU on policy. Yeah, we also have uh, people who are working in um, really innovative areas of things like green bonds um, in the city. We've got lots of people um, working in banking um, and we have um, alumni, um, you know, doing PhDs, whether that's um, anywhere around the world or, or, or staying here in the UK to do their PhDs. So um, I, I could talk for a long time about our alumni. Uh, we, we get lots of them in come into our programme and talk actually. So one of the lovely things you can do is actually meet some of our alumni, whether they've just graduated or they've been gone for 10 years or more um, and you get to connect and, and that's fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. So we only have a um, few minutes to go. And I would like to say, um, Amir, you've mentioned in your presentation, but Espina, did you mention where the students have gone to? Uh, in terms of um, jobs Previous, yes. yes. Yeah, same as Catherine, uh, quite a mix of destinations from starting a PhD to going into consultancies or NGOs or think tanks even, or go working for the government, essentially. So we are a much newer MSc program. So we do have much fewer alumni compared to EPI, which is a huge and established, um, a well-established MSc program at, uh, at the Energy Institute. But overall, we see a quite similar mix of uh, destinations as well. Thank you. Um, there's been, I'll just pass you over to you to round up. I think we've got one minute left. Yeah, one minute to go. <laughs> yeah, so thanks everyone. Um, it was great to have you here and we are looking forward to meeting you on campus. And good luck with your applications if you choose to apply. Thank you. Bye-bye.